Thank you. Hi, everyone. As he said, I'm Jeff Smith. I'm from x.ai. And today we're going to talk about reactive feature generation with Spark and MLlib. So quick intro to me. I work at x.ai. Uh, we make an artificial intelligence that schedules meetings. You just CC her on all of your meetings. And Amy will take care of all of the pain of negotiating times and locations with anyone you might want to have a meeting with. Uh, I spend the rest of my free time uh, drawing and blogging and thinking about all these interesting ideas about how we can build machine learning systems in new and better ways. And so you can find that in some of my blogging and soon in a book for Manning. Uh, and that's really kind of the focus here today is on that concept that I've been playing with recently. And that concept is reactive machine learning. We're only going to talk about a part of that today, but I want to give you a little bit of a context to give you grounding as to what are these related set of ideas and how do they inform how we approach the problem of feature generation specifically. So what is reactive machine learning? Well, as I conceive of it, reactive machine learning is this game I've been playing with my dog. So I kick the ball and say, OK, let's, let's figure out what a machine learning system is. And so here's where we've settled so far. Uh, and it's on five components to a machine learning system. And these are things going from collecting raw data to generating features uh, to going all the way through th learning models and being able to publish them out, make predictions, and, and keep the machine running. So this is just a sort of high-level abstraction, but it gives us a great way of, of framing our discussion about what part of the system are we working on right now. And in particular, in this talk, we're going to focus directly in on generating features. And I'll dive pretty deep into what specifically I mean by that and, and what, that, what those configurations of those systems can look like. Uh, before I do that, though, I need to introduce you to the other half of reactive machine learning, which is reactive systems. Uh, since this isn't a Scala conference, I'm going to assume that some of you might not have read the Reactive Manifesto. Briefly, the Reactive Manifesto defines a sort of idealized system that has these four traits uh, that really make it the system we want to build in 2016. And that is that it is responsive, that it responds to user input in consistent time bounds. It's resilient. It gets back, it gets back up when it gets knocked down. That is, it responds uh, to failure. Uh, it's elastic. It can scale up and it can scale down. And it's message driven, so we don't couple state on a single node. We are fully distributed, and we're passing that information across using a message passing semantic. The Reactive Manifesto, when it was originally released, outlined three strategies to go with those traits, ways that you could achieve those things within your system. And those are briefly replication, containment, and supervision. Uh, so those are tools in our toolbox, and I'm going to come back to these tools again and again in this talk. Uh, but as I try to extend the concepts of reactive to the problem of machine learning systems, there's more to machine learning that is different than, say, a web app. And so I start with, what are the characteristics of machine learning data? And what I've gotten to is that, first, that machine learning data is effectively infinite. That is, we can generate as much data as we want to because we're performing arbitrary transformations. Uh, so this is arbitrary arbitrarily sized data sets, perfect for Spark uh, and perfect for an approach that, that takes that into account. And the other aspect of it is that machine learning data is intrinsically and pervasively uncertain. There are certain things that we are never going to know definitively in a machine learning system. This is also points us to a, a list of uh, techniques and strategies that we can use that I've listed down there at the bottom. I'm not going to go into detail there. I'm going to try and show them in context as we try to build out a feature generation system. So that's reactive machine learning in a, in a very, very small nutshell. Uh, and I can point you to some more resources later to get it a bigger nutshell to, to consider that in. Uh, but that's where we're going to be focused today, just on the feature generation system. So let's talk about features. What do I mean when I say features? Uh, this is the data science track. I imagine a lot of you have a, have a mental model of what you think a feature is. Uh, I'm going to explain features in the context of an idealized system. I'm not going to be talking about how do you schedule meetings with an artificial intelligence. I'm going to be talking about arboreal animals. And I don't know if you know this about arboreal animals, that is, animals that dwell in trees, but they have their own Twitter. It's a, it's a microblogging social network uh, consisting of squawks, which are posts of 140 characters or less, users known as squawkers, and really, really popular users who put out all sorts of squawks and have all sorts of followers, and those are called super squawkers. Uh, this network is called Pigeon. Uh, it's purely for arboreal animals, so those of you who live on land cannot get a, an account. But there's some very interesting things about that data set. For one thing is that, of course, we have an effectively infinite data set. We have the fire hose of pigeon data, all of those squawks coming through. The next thing is, of course, is that it is effectively uncertain. That is, there are things we don't know about what's in that text and what that ultimately means because we're asking higher level questions, because we're doing machine learning and generating features. So what features are we generating? Well, we're going to go from raw data out to derived, semantically meaningful features. And we're going to talk in great detail about how that works. This is our sort of idealized picture that you should keep in the back of your mind as we navigate through all of this. 
The Pigeon data team has enormous problems with being able to handle its scale, that infinite data, and the complexity of its data, so it's hired out an awesome data engineer to build out this pipeline. His name is Lemmy, he's a ring-tailed lemur. He is an awesome data engineer with great experience in Scala and Spark, and I'm gonna show you some of his work today. So to begin, I'm gonna start with feature transforms. So to be clear on terminology here, we're gonna be working in fairly abstract terms and rather than getting, always being tied specifically to the terminology within Spark implementations. So in this context, what I mean by feature transforms is this. When we have raw data and we're trying to make it into semantically useful, meaningful features that we can learn a model from, we first extract out features, we take that raw data and turn it into something that is possibly useful, and then we perform other arbitrary transforms on that. And so those other tra transforms are really taking a possible feature and turning it into another feature. So in type signature, that's feature to feature. Uh, and this is kind of the heart of our feature generation pipeline. We extract, we transform, and then we have features. So, I'm gonna focus right now to start on transforms, because transforms are actually really nice and really simple, because they're basically just, they can be single one-liners, they're just math. Here's an implementation in Scala, all it says is that a feature type is a thing that has a value type uh, and, and, and a name. So we, we're going to name our features and we're gonna ensure that they are doubles if we say that they're doubles. Uh, here's an example showing that we're, we can do, create case classes out of that, so that's int features and boolean features, and you can go on and on for all of the useful types within your system. Here's an example of a very simple transform function. So this isn't a whole transform, this is just the individual transform function, again, you could do it in a single line. Uh, two things I wanna call out here is, one is that I'm ensuring that it's named, and that its name matches its function name. So this is a binarized function, so this just simply means, is the value bigger than the threshold? Really trivial, so why am I hammering home that this is, this is hard stuff and important and you should do it the right way? Let me show you another one. This one isn't actually that much harder. It's, it's some nicer Scala code. Uh, if you're not awesome at Scala, if you haven't spent much time in it, it might take you a little while to write this one. It certainly took me a little while to write this one. All it does is categorization. That is, given a list of thresholds, it puts it into in a generated number of bins. Really useful, commonly applied throughout your feature generation pipeline, likely. Uh, you want to get that in a place in which you have it commonly accessible and has a recognizable name so that you can uh, know what it is and when it was applied. Y if you've been paying attention, you know I'm a little bit obsessed with names and you might not be. That's fine. Let me show you why I'm obsessed with names. That first bit of code up there, I've been informed I need to tell you is a hack. It's bad. Don't put it in your production code. But it does work in my code. Uh, so what this does is it allows us to just call out to that naming function so that we say within the scope of the, of the transform function itself, we know what name we are. So we know that we've applied the binarized function. Why do I want to know so much? Why am I so concerned about what name of function I'm, I'm applying? Well, that's because I want to build a lineage. A lineage looks something like this once you get to the end. After we've applied all of these extraction functions and transform functions, we get a clean, normalized, categorized uh, interactions data. Uh, well, in lineage form, we understand that that's a series of operations that we performed. We can trace back from that. Uh, and I'm gonna show you several techniques within this talk that are based around the idea that you're gonna reason about your features in all sorts of parts of the system based on your knowledge about what they are, their current state, uh, in a way that uses a message passing semantic. You're not going to tightly couple all of this logic together. You're just going to put information out there and other people can act upon it as they will. So, without further ado, we're gonna leave the world of pure single node Scala and enter the world of big data pipelines. This is a Spark conference, so let's start, Spark, start talking about Spark pipelines. Uh, again, our idealized view, raw data through our feature generation pipeline out to our feature set. Uh, what you might find in a real world feature generation system is something that looks more like this. We, we extract out some data and then we throw it into the database and then we read that data back in and then we transform that data. Oftentimes you'll find something that's a lot closer to spaghetti and has 20 steps and you can see really complex series of transformations and each of those steps in between maybe has some sort of persistence out to S3 or HDFS or a distributed database. And I don't like this because of that guy. That guy's an orchestrator. He's someone like Luigi or Uzi who's responsible for putting all of these pieces together. Sitting on top, making sure that all of these things happen when they're supposed to happen. I don't like it because I built a Spark pipeline and I've got a better option. The better option is pipeline composition. That is, if I have a 
extract function that returns an RDD of int features and a transform function that could consume that RDD of int features, I can simply compose them in Scala code. I want to do this because in my idealized pipeline form, what was one of the great things I got? Well, I got all sorts of great features out of Spark. The one that I'm most concerned with right now is laziness. I've delayed all that decision making about what to do during runtime because I know exactly what's going to happen through my composition so that the Spark execution planner can make good decisions, can recalculate in the event of failure, and is not dependent upon some sort of external function that doesn't have a fine-grained understanding of the structure of my data in the way that the RDD abstraction does and everything higher level that's built on top of it. So to summarize, to put it in sort of uh, uh, in a single phrase, don't orchestrate when you can compose. I think that's a great option for those of you who are working on building Spark pipelines, especially for building features. So uh, I seem to have a lot of concerns about things that maybe other people aren't concerned with. I, I don't know if everyone's concerned about this one. Pipeline failure. Has anyone had a pipeline fail before? Has anything ever gone down on you before? Well, it happened at Pigeon. So, at Pigeon, they had this core machine learning pipeline. Here's the feature generation component of it. It processes all the data in the network. Uh, they also serve, their, uh, their network also serves the Panamanian rainforest. Now, the Panamanian rainforest, as represented by the poison dart frog, has extremely restrictive regulations about the use of its data. So all of its data must be processed within the Panamanian rainforest. And so the thing about Panamanian rainforests is they're made out of trees and sometimes trees burn down. What do you do in that case? What do you do uh, when your feature generation system goes down completely? Well, in this case, I'm gonna point out another reactive pattern, which is to simply use replication. That is, we want to take advantage of the fact that we have another whole set of features we can use. Uh, that is the network-wide, the pigeon feature extraction pipeline collection. I'm gonna show you that in code a little bit later. All right. So, I'm concerned with failure, so let's supervise. We like supervision, right? Supervision is another reactive strategy we can rely upon, but what does that mean? How can we decompose that? What, what are some of the pieces that we should put that in place? Well, I'm gonna say that there are three things that we can do to supervise our feature generation pipelines. Uh, the first is that we can focus on reactive database drivers. The second is that we can look to what cluster managers can do. And the third is we can focus on things like feature validation. So briefly, let's talk about database drivers. There's a lot of database interested folks here. Uh, here are some uh, Couchbase, Mongo, and Cassandra are some interesting databases that I've seen good work come out of their connectors and their database drivers that allow you to interface with Spark. So what are they doing? What are they doing that you should care about this implementation? Well, first is they're dealing with resilience for you. They're detecting when their nodes have failed and routing traffic around. They're dealing with elasticity. They're detecting when nodes are swamped with traffic and then again routing traffic around. And then ultimately, this gives you better semantics for coding as if you were dealing with infinite data. So really best connectors that you will see out there uh, for interacting with powerful distributed databases uh, have things like uh, uh, the ability to interact with things like reactive streams or ACA streams implementations or Spark streaming. That's something you want out of your reactive database driver because it gives you greater supervision capabilities. Here's an example of some couch-based code. It's really trivial code, right? So we're just querying it from the view. Uh, one thing I would like to call out, though, is that it does use a pure function, right? So that we've, we've got this very clean semantic for reasoning about what is it that we're pr providing here because we're using a view that exists purely within the database and we're not in any way reasoning about the size of our data set or trying to perform a limit or something like that. Moving down to the next step there. Uh, within our feature generation pipeline, it's just briefly worth calling out that due to the cluster managers, we have a great deal of supervision capability out of the box if we take advantage of it. And so these are, uh, of our three known cluster managers, Spark Standalone, Mesos, and Yarn, uh, what are the things they're doing? Well, they're doing some of the same things. They're, they're concerned with elasticity. They're doing things like dynamic resource allocation. Uh, they're making sure that uh, your work gets spread around efficiently. Uh, and they're handling things like node failure when nodes drop out. And of course, they do this by being very message driven, by, by communicating across the cluster and not, and not coupling all that knowledge tightly together. So that's my view of supervising feature generation. You'll notice I've skipped that last bit on feature validation because that's where we're gonna end with. I need to put that topic on the shelf first because I need to introduce a different topic and that is feature collections. So we have individual features, we've been talking about these features, but what happens when we put them into a collection? How do we reason about them at the collection level? Well. Here's some basic Scala code here showing some ideas of, of, of a basic feature set, the first one that Lemmy built. So Lemmy thought, okay, let's, let's just look at the length of the squawk. It's less than 140 characters. We're gonna use this to build up our predictive model of who's gonna be a super squawker. So we have a, we have a feature set of one and we have one concept label, fine. 
Lemmy does some more work. He builds up more features. He has some history-based features on past squawks of squawkers. So he, he's able to add that out to his feature set. He grows his feature set, generates more features, learns new models. And even more, takes it to the point of detecting whether or not that squawker is on a mobile device at that point in time to give them more predictive capability around who will become a future super squawker. How would we structure a data structure to encapsulate what is a feature collection? Well, we might do it like that. We would just say, give it an ID, a created that date, and say, here is a set of features and the given concept label. Uh, we're gonna iterate on this data model, but this is the basics. So given this basic model, uh, we would say, here's our earlier collection of features, here's our later one, and we can throw these into an RDD, and then we can perform processing on them. So something's gonna happen now, right? Something is going, exciting is always happening within the world of arboreal animals. And what that thing is, is the same thing that might be happening in your world, and it's bugs. Bugs pop up. Uh, the world's not perfect, and certainly the world is not perfect in the forest. And so there's a problem with our mobile data. We've detected that that code is fundamentally corrupt, and we can no longer use it within our feature set. So we need to reason about that somehow. So remember that Lemmy had that initial feature set that was really basic, but it was good. He built a model from it. It was fine. We can use it as a fallback. So here is just defining out that fallback collection that we have the ability to use. And then following that, we'll define a validation function. This, this is a little bit complex here, but it's really just checking to see at the end of the process, when we have performed all of our feature generation, uh, do we have any features within that feature collection uh, that are invalid? If so, we need to throw them out and see what remains. We might be left with absolutely nothing at that point, and so then we can gracefully degrade back to our known safe state, which is the fallback collection, the original uh, squawk length feature collection. Uh, I call this a possible worlds technique in that it's a way of reasoning about uncertainty by allowing yourself to say that we may be in an okay state, we may not be in an okay state, we don't have that localized knowledge. So we just want to be able to, uh, to use replication, produce both of these things and have both as an option. Uh, and it's, it's of course a way of encoding a sort of uncertain data semantic, right? So there are things we don't know about what may have changed since we started our future generation job. All right. So I, I've been talking about validating features and making sure that everything's okay. I mentioned that at the end of this diagram, after we've generated out some features, before we persist them off in the database, before we hand off to the model learning process, there's more that we want to do. We, we're really concerned with how can we supervise this and make this a successful process. So I want to introduce you to the details of this last problem here. We're trying to predict out super squawkers. So Sam the squirrel on the left and Steve the sloth, one of them is going to become a super squawker this month. They're both new users on the Pigeon Data Network, but we don't know. So we're gonna need to generate out our features and learn our models. So let's look specifically at how we would do this. Let's walk it through the process. In general, we have to produce training instances. We need our feature vectors, our concept labels. We need to be able to identify them. That's what this code shows here. Uh, and then we want to do, uh, we want to put them in data frames. And by putting them in data frames, we get to take advantage of powerful MLlib functionality. And so this example is gonna show you how to do some of that today. So we're in a data frame here, and we defined a constant k equal to two. That's for feature selection. So why do we wanna do feature selection? Well, feature selection is a really important technique whereby we just say that we want these top certain features at using the chi-squared selector from the MLlib here, and we want to only use those ones. Because remember, we could have millions of features available. We don't want to use that infinite data for the entire process. We just simply want to delay that decision about which features to use until we know what we want. This sets up our selector. Uh, this executes our selector. And then we have a selected set of features. This is great. This is really powerful functionality within MLlib. It's super useful. If you're not using it today, you should take a look at it. Uh, I want to show you something that takes it just a bit further and kind of turns MLlib on its head a bit. So how do we know this worked? I mean, it certainly returned a data frame, but how do we know it did what we wanted? Well, I'm going to show you a little bit of a type dance here, so we're going to have to go back to RDDs in this case. Uh, it's hopeful, I'm hopeful that in Spark 2.0 uh, or later, we'll be able to do this without having to pass directly through RDDs. So data frames to RDDs, just getting back our label points, our instances, and we're gonna use some more MLlib functionality, and we're gonna perform the chi-squared test over each one of those instances, and then we're going to get some sort of uh, p-value out of that, right? So that we, we know for the entire set now, uh, what was that chi-squared value that we, we used within our chi-squared selector, and we can compare it to a cutoff. This allows us to validate. Did we, in fact, have a good enough feature selection process or in fact, do we have a, a quite poor feature collection that we should not pass on to the next set? 
I, again, I would call this a possible worlds uh, technique. We, we don't know in advance. We're going to do the work and we'll, we'll delay that decision towards later uh, we'll, and we'll allow other consumers of our feature collection to make that decision. It's a way of encoding the uncertainty in our data as a way of taming it. And again, how are we going to persist this out? How are we going to pass this information on? Uh, it's the same feature collection data model that I showed you before with the extensions of we're going to persist out that it passed validation or not and the, the uh, cutoff that we used at that point in time. So this decouples the decision making from the feature generation pipeline. We're going to effectively pass the message to the next phase in the process, that is the model learning process, because we may have many model learning processes that have different semantics about how they want to handle what constitute valid features for their use case. So to conclude, that was reactive feature generation. What we saw here was a way of conceptualizing a machine learning system, focusing in on, a, on feature generation specifically. Uh, we saw some traits of beautiful reactive systems that we can aspire to in our systems, even complex machine learning systems. We can use the reactive strategies, but we don't have to just stop there. There's a lot more that comes to machine learning data that is really important to reason about and that Spark and MLLib give you great tools to work with. I encourage you to become master of your bugs, to become king of the forest, to build beautiful feature generation pipelines that are reactive, that are resilient, responsive, elastic, message driven. Uh, all the tools are capable in your hands and as Spark programmers, you're uniquely qualified to take on this large challenge. That's my talk. You can find a lot more information at reactivemachinelearning.com. You can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, you can check out x.ii. And of course, like everyone else, we are absolutely hiring for anyone who wants to build reactive machine learning systems. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Any questions? That was entertaining, thanks. Sure. I appreciate the stand up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big fan of reactive, but with, with analysis and with machine learning, mm -hmm. you tend to do a lot of iterations mm -hmm. and store kind of intermediate data sets. So mm -hmm. if you were composing everything, wouldn't it, wouldn't it just become a huge mess? Right, so you have the option, right? And so uh, uh, there's, it's one of the great options that you have actually within the way that Spark composes pipelines. So what I told you was, I say, uh, don't orchestrate when you can compose. And you can compose in that case when you want to save out the intermediates because when you have those RDDs, you still have the ability to save as file or something or send it out to, uh, to, a, uh, to your particular database. And that doesn't have to impede the composition, right? So that Spark can build out an extremely complex directed acyclic graph and still all of those phases are composed, but then you have some little part off of it that, that saves out uh, to, to S S3, HDFS, whatever the case may be. And if you want to do those, uh, if you want to save those intermediates. This doesn't mean don't save your intermediates. It means don't use your database as your method of communication in between steps on an executing cluster job. You mentioned that naming things was really important, and I agree. Is there a way you recommend handling this at a larger, well, is there a good solution to handle this naming? I think it starts with the structure of your code base, ultimately. Uh, I showed some, you know, the, the hacky code is just something that I can put on a slide and explain within a minute or two, um, which is just look up what function you're in. Uh, I think that there's, I think that's an important part of like how you establish what is your feature generation code base and, and how it defines those things out. There's lots of ways of doing that. I think it's actually quite deeply tied to what you choose as your serialization strategy. In the previous talk, uh, the Emleaf guys talked about uh, PMML versus spray JSON. This is, this is totally the heart of the thing. So what you name it should give you the ability to reason about it in a sort of machine driven way, but it should also give you the, way, the ability within the prediction phase to pull up all of those uh, feature generation functionality, the, the transformers, the extractors, whatever, uh, and replay them. So it's, it's, it's totally tied with that decision. Uh, ML pipelines are a partial uh, answer to that in that they allow you to serialize a pipeline. Uh, but a, as you heard in the previous talk, there's lots of challenges with applying ML pipelines uh, when used in production. Uh, so I, th I think you need to, to come up with a solution that suits you, whether it be PMML, some sort of JSON format, uh, or improvements to, to ML pipelines within Spark itself 
that make it more applicable for, uh, for real-time predictions. Okay, let's give Jeffrey one last round Thank of you applause. All.